ridicule of older men of the medical profession who claim that already they have a cure for every known disease. They're astonished by the answer from young Nostradamus that he is preparing a cure for an epidemic which will devastate the world. He, Nostradamus alone, will be ready with the medicine for a great disaster which will come upon the human race. Nostrum, he will call his cure. Nostrum, derived from his own name. A great disaster indeed. A new epidemic that no one has ever heard of. And a cure that he alone will have. Certainly, young Nostradamus has been working too hard. His mind is wandering. But young Madame Nostradamus does not scoff. And inspired by her understanding and sympathy, glorified by the adoration of his two splendid young sons, Nostradamus determines to continue his experiments, to discover the cure for the oncoming curse, a remedy to halt the great disaster that is, according to his own ominous foreboding, to strike the human race like a thunderbolt from the heavens. And then, like the proverbial thunderbolt, the great disaster does strike. All Europe is blasted by the deadly Black Plague, a disease that causes men to swoon at the sight of its sign on a door, a black death that runs riot and rampant, destined to kill half the population of Europe, a disease so terrible that people die a very fight of the scourge. But what of the Nostrum, Nostradamus medicine? True to his own prediction and plans, it proves efficacious. Nostradamus patients are the ones who recover from the ghastly black plague, while millions are dying on every hand despite every other frantic medical effort. Indeed, the very word Nostrum is destined to become, down through the ages and in many tongues, a general name for any medicine. But although dubbed one of the greatest physicians of all time, by one of those bitter whimsies of fate, the victims of the Black Plague our young miracle man cannot cure are those nearest and dearest to him. In a brief space of time and with great suddenness, his wife and two children are swept away in the horrid black deluge, leaving him a man bereft and grieving. And so, with a bitter reflection of a great physician who could save others but not his own, Nostradamus abandons the practice of medicine and becomes a wanderer on the face of the earth, a man constantly studying, thinking, searching for some new solace, some new thought, some new insight into the eternal mystery of life some way that mankind can avoid the awful disasters of mortal existence, thus can shape his destinies for the future by being able to look ahead into the world of things that have not yet happened, but which are inevitably to occur. Thus, forsaking the material and the physical, his mind turns to the spiritual, the metaphysical, the supernatural, the divine. He shuts himself off from the world by retiring to a monastery, the Abbey of Orval, where day and night he dreams and studies and reasons and calculates, expanding his knowledge into new fields, weird or wonderful. Until he has evolved a fantastic scheme he believes will enable him to foretell a future things. He begins conceiving a book called Prophetic Centuries, curious cryptic verses in which he foretells future events. Some are hard to understand, others impossible, for each line is couched in the vaguest language. In that day and age, to be too explicit might well mean having your head chopped off for sorcery. The first of these prophetic verses, published in 1555, are readily interpreted as a prediction that the King of France, Henry II, will die a cruel death occasioned by the loss of an eye in a golden cage in a duel. Pretty ridiculous that sounds, doesn't it? But Nostradamus goes on to speak of the three sons of the king and his queen, the ambitious Catherine de' Medici, saying that all three sons will ascend the throne, which pleases Catherine de' Medici as she visualizes her three sons ruling over most of Europe. But no one can take seriously such foolish mouthings. That is, until four years later, on July the 10th, 1559, when in a royal tournament, the king's opponent accidentally thrusts his lance between the bars of Henry's visor. In a golden cage he shall put out his eye. The visor of Henry's armor was of gold. And the three sons? The oldest becomes King Francis II on his father's death. But soon he dies. And the second son sits on Francis' throne as Charles IX. Until death strikes again. And the youngest becomes Henry III. Three sons, each on a throne. But it was the same throne. And now, no longer people laugh as from the brooding sorcerer come more staggering forecasts. 
He foresees that the Senate of London will put to death their king. 91 years later, Parliament executes Charles I. That a great fire will almost destroy the city of London. And so it happens 100 years later in 1666, when the great city is blasted by flames almost to obliteration. He predicts that the new found lands in the West, the little colonies of America, will win their independence from England and specifies that important in this victory will be a Scottish pirate. Well, there was an American Revolution, you know, and they called John Paul Jones the Scottish pirate two centuries later. He foretells a revolution that shall come to his own country, that a king will be too yielding, will follow the whims of his light but loyal wife, and that the king's own benevolence will cause his death, resulting from his capture in the forest of Barren. 223 years later, the French Revolution, when the weakly character Louis XVI allows himself to tolerate Marie Antoinette's escapades and extravagances, thus precipitating a bloody uprising. The king and queen attempt to flee the mob, are executed after being captured in the forest of Varennes. Again, the astounding man stares into the unknown and sees the existence of a ruler of France who will not bear the name of the French royal line, who will be feared like the lightning, make Italy, Spain, and England tremble, and, uh, as Nostradamus puts it so charmingly, shall be much taken with foreign women. Yes, Napoleon Bonaparte, who married an Austrian and was enamored of Polish and Egyptian uh, ladies. Unbelievable as it may seem, this man of mystery in the middle of the 16th century writes of a great empire on the throne of which a young king shall be troubled by the answer of a lady who is not of his nation, and that he will abdicate the throne in favor of a younger brother. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And 372 years ago, he foresees that a great army shall cross Hister's Bridge, shall seize Vienna and the whole land of Austria. A thousand of these verses drain from the magic pen. The last one predicts that, his mission completed, he shall go to his God, and that his friends will find him dead, near to his bed in the bench, tomorrow at sunrise. That's where they find him, smiling peacefully in his last sleep, having looked ahead into the darkness of the yet to be and seen his own name written there. Ridiculous? You can go today in the year 1938 to the British Museum and hold in your hand a book printed 332 years ago and read these things. Could Nostradamus have been gifted with a sixth sense? We know that the future does exist already because it is made up of the results of unalterable causes that exist in the present. We know that anything that can happen always will happen if we wait long enough. But there's an opportunity for some of you to answer the riddle for yourselves. For one of Nostradamus' verses predicts that in the year 1999, a king will come out of Asia who will speak a strange tongue and will invade and destroy Paris by means of frightful fiery weapons from the sky. Asiatic planes over Paris in 1999, that's 60 years away. Some of you will be here then and will know the truth or fantasy of this monstrous prognostication. But until men have learned the secret of the universe and so can be masters of their own futures to watch them approach unafraid, I give you Michel de Nostradamus, a charlatan or a man gifted beyond all other men. What do you think? <laughs>